Thank you for joining me. I know it's probably been a long week or a long weekend, and I flew in last night, so I'm fresh as a daisy. Um, since we do have a small group, I'm going to probably just kind of be, keep it casual, if you don't mind. Like, uh, I'm going to call on you more directly. Uh, what markets do you all trade? Or what, what, what markets do you like to trade? Stocks? Individual stocks? Okay. Sir? Options on stocks? That's what I do primarily, options on stocks. Sir? Futures? Uh, what, uh, what market? Oh. My heart goes out to you. Uh, well, the grain markets have just been frustrating. To I'm also the chief commodity analyst at Elliott Wave International, so I've been wrestling with the uh, the grain markets for quite some time. Uh, everything looked great until all this stuff with China happened, and then it looks like it's going to you know resolve. And I'm like, okay, great, ten dollar beans, and then we don't know. And then live cattle. Uh, I don't know what's been going on with live cattle for the last what, four to six weeks, and that's gone up like a rocket. What other markets? Options, options, individual stocks. I like options on individual stocks. That probably accounts for about 80% of what I do as a trader. The other 20% would be the futures markets. Uh, but when it comes to futures markets, I tend to trade just kind of like the big five, uh, E-mini S&P, crude oil, gold, and bonds. Um, Although I tend to avoid gold because uh, it, it's a very volatile market and it's really difficult to trade gold with a tight stop. And I like to trade with tight stops. And it seems like as soon as you put in what you think is more than enough appropriate risk in a gold trade, like you know, 1425.3, they'll run the market to 1425.3 even for one contract. Um, I don't see that as an issue as much, uh, say, for example, with the bond market. I like trading bonds. Every, the, the ebb and flow seems to be much more orderly in the bond market. And also, to the bond market trends nicely. So um, I'm going to be talking, of course, about the wave principle today. Who's familiar with the wave principle? Yes? Yes? Nobody knew. Good, good. Now you're ready for my dog and pony show, because I'm going to convince you, or at least suggest. You may want to take a look at it. Uh, this is who me, uh, who I am. I'm the Chief Commodity Analyst at Elliott Wave International, and I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of a service called Trader's Classroom. And in Trader's Classroom, I teach technical analysis. Um, <clears throat> I am a professional technician. I taught on the college level at Georgia Tech for five years. I've been doing this for a long, long, long time. Um, and in that service, I teach different, really all forms of technical analysis, not just the wave principle, but candlesticks, indicators and oscillators, uh, trading, trading setups, being able to identify a good trade setup versus a bad trade setup. I like to, the, the, I, I really enjoy being the editor of Trader's Classroom because my focus really is to teach you to be able to do this yourself, okay? And, and I kind of sometimes maybe get in a little trouble with my company because I love selling newsletters. It's my business. But I prefer, my, here's my ideal subscriber. I like to see somebody sign up with me. And then in about two to three years, I love to get those emails where I've learned enough. I'm ready to go off on my own. Thank you. And then maybe a year later, I might get an email back saying, hey, I think life's great. Um, but no, the real purpose for me as editor of Trader's Classroom is to teach you to do this yourself, okay? Kind of like teach a man a fish sort of thing. Um, very important, I think, this quote. I like quotes. I think you saw my earlier quote from Confucius. Uh, I like quotes. The limits of my language are the limits of my universe. That could not be more true. Okay? Can anyone read this? Of course. <laughs> There's always one. Okay? There's always one. Um, I can't. Like I said, I used to teach at Georgia Tech. <clears throat> and in the, um, what was the name of the course? Quantitative and Computational Finance. I was teaching technical analysis. And there were uh, 
I, I would pull up a slide like this and go, can anybody read this? Lots of hands went up. <clears throat> um, I can't. I do not know the language. How about this? Really? That's a first. Okay? I'm not an electrical engineer. I can't read this. How about this? I can't read this because I'm certainly not musically inclined. Okay, the point is, these are languages. Well, technical analysis is a language. Does anybody know what the language this is? Exactly. That's an old school chart pattern. Chart reading, chart reading 101, that's a language. Some of you have seen this, a little bit of this. This is Elliott Wave. This is a style of analysis. Technical analysis is an umbrella term, okay? And under that umbrella term are many different just disciplines, schools, okay? You have Wyckoff, you have point and figure, you have candlestick analysis, you have the wave principle, you have indicators and oscillators, okay? Technical analysis is just simply not a specific term. It incorporates actually many different languages or dialects. Here we're just simply looking at a price chart RSI with stochastic and some moving averages. Here's another one. I showed this earlier when I was doing my presentation over at the CME booth. Uh, Donchian channels, candlesticks, percent R. Very simple. Um, the, le uh, the wave principle, again, is a language. And I think it is a useful, valuable language to know and understand. Now, whenever I teach uh, the wave principle, I've been doing this for, uh, I've been with the company Elliott Wave International for, for 25 years. And there are times where I, I feel your pain. There's a lot of, um, uh, whenever I have discussions about the wave principle, people are like, it's too complicated. I don't understand it. I don't see it. And to a certain extent, I can agree with that. But I will have to say that probably that is because you did not have a good teacher. Okay? Simply put. Uh, I hope I can fill that role for you today. This right here, this is the money shot. Okay? Take pictures if you want. The wave principle starts here. This is the foundation of the Elliott wave principle. Everything else that we know about the wave principle originates here with these five patterns. Over here to the left, we have an impulse wave and a diagonal then a zigzag, and a flat, and a triangle. What the wave principle does is that it classifies price action into two specific modalities, motive waves and corrective waves. You have two types of motive waves, the impulse, right here, and then the diagonal. The other three are corrective wave patterns. These are trending price moves. These are counter-trend price moves. That's it these five patterns. Everything else that we know, for example, running triangles, barrier triangles, expanding triangles, running flats, expanded flats, they all come from these. So these are the basics. Now this is what we need to master. Okay, now when I first began learning and reading Bob's work and understanding the wave principle, which was actually originated by a gentleman in the 1930s by the name of Ralph Nelson Elliott, um, I had problems. And my biggest problem was I could look at the book and I could see the line diagrams, uh, like what I just showed you. I could see this stuff all day long and I could label the hell out of it. It was easy. You give me a line diagram and I could, man, I could put those ones and twos and those A's and B's everywhere. But when it came to a real price chart such as this, it was just like, whew, um, my eyes crossed. I couldn't, I couldn't see the pattern come out. Okay? So there are some tricks that you can do to pull the pattern out, and that's to eliminate the noise. For example, one thing that you can do is put on a moving average, uh, like about a five period or an eight period moving average on price, 
And then you can see the little ups and downs in the moving average. You can use those to aid you in identifying the patterns. Or you can use a price channel. That's another th just simple trick. But I incorporated these slides here because I just wanted to show you, okay, if you're looking for an impulse wave here, well, what does that look like on a price chart? Well, it looks like this. That's a nice impulse wave in Bank of America. This is a nice ending diagonal. Old school technicians refer to this as a rising wedge or a terminal wedge. This is what a zigzag looks like. Down, up, down, A, B, C, set. Zigzags, as are most corrective or counter trend price movement, tend to be contained by parallel lines. Very simple. This is a flat, three down in A, three up in B, followed by a five wave move in C. That's what these patterns look like on a price chart. Now this is a triangle, but specifically this is a running triangle because wave B terminates beyond the wave A extreme. Okay, these examples are crystal clear. This is what I call textbook. Does everybody, could everybody see the clarity of what I just offered? Okay, we need interaction, otherwise I get bored and you fall asleep and I'll come over here and I'll start picking on EQ. Start calling you by your name. Brian, thank you for showing up. Okay. Um, do these, were these examples clear? Thank you. Okay. Uh, which then begs the question. If I go home and I was like, yeah, I kind of kind of see what he's going, that guy was talking about. And you go home and you look at whatever price chart, maybe you're looking at Merck or Pfizer or Eli Lilly or whatever, and you're looking at these price charts and it's like, well, I don't see what he's talking about. What do I do? Okay, very simple. You do not trade that market. Bottom line, I'll go through 200 price charts and then find 20 where I might see something recognizable. And then out of that 20, I may only come up with three or four that have the quality that I want to take a shot at and actually trade. Now, of those 200 price charts, as an Elliotician, as a professional Elliotician, yeah, I can give you wave counts and everything. But when you boil it down and raise the bar, Okay, where well, you're looking for textbook quality, you're looking for all the rules and guidelines to be adhered to, you're looking for all the appropriate Fibonacci relationships to be present. Those high quality, those are few and far between. But that's all I trade. Okay, again, like I was saying earlier, trading is hard enough as it is without making it more difficult. So stop making it difficult, keep it simple. The wave principle is useful for these reasons. Uh, the wave principle aids you in identifying trend. It aids you in identifying counter trend moves. I hope by now everybody understands the significance of a counter trend price move because that's your opportunity to rejoin the trend. It determines uh, the maturity of the trend by doing so with the five-way structure. Fibonacci objectives allow me to identify high probability objectives and targets. And also, too, and this is a cool thing about technical analysis in general, if used appro appropriately, is it allows me to identify points of invalidation or specific points of ruin. But basically, that's just kind of a fancy way of letting me know I know to the penny, pip, tick, or satoshi where I'm wrong. Okay? It's hard to read an economic report and know in XYZ stock where you're wrong. Okay, but with technical analysis, it gives you the edge of precision when it comes to risk management. Uh, and typically on a given trade, you're not risking, or I don't risk, more than the range of a single price bar. Keep it tight. Okay, uh, my book, Elliott Wave Trading by uh, Wayne Gorman and myself, basically just you know, talking about why, uh, why it's, a, again, a valuable tool. Now, I said I wanted some interaction, so I actually built into the slide presentation a quiz for you to take now to make sure I have that interaction. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've been doing the public speaking thing for 10 or 15 years, and I remember, I'll get on a side note for a moment because it looks like I've got the rest of the day here. 
I remember the first time I spoke publicly in front of a crowd of people. It was a small crowd of about 10 or 15 people. And, and I did what they said to do. You know, I had my, my, my speech written out. I had my slides in my presentation. And I was ready up there. It was like my first shot at getting in front of a crowd, being promoted within the company. I was so proud of myself. And then I get in front of the, comp the, the I get in, in front of the podium, and I'm locked in like a tick. I'm locked in, and I start reading my, my presentation. I'm not looking at the audience. I'm not looking, I'm reading the presentation. And then about three quarters of the way down on the very first page, I lose my spot. And then there's this like really awkward silence. And it's just like, can I start again? I actually said that. It's like, can I start again? And I made up some joke like, you know, they don't let me out of the basement very often, so I'm not good at this. Um, and then, and, and then this, believe it or not, the same thing happened again. And um, so finally, I, I put it aside and I talked about what I knew and what I loved, and that's the chart. And once I began doing that, I began to find my rhythm as a public speaker. And one of the things I thrive on is the interaction, because again, I'm here to talk to you, help you. Pop quiz, what do we have here? Remember, five patterns. You have the impulse wave. You have the ending diagonal. You have the zigzag, the flat, and the triangle. Now remember, the triangle is a sideways little move contained within converging trend lines. A zigzag is comprised of three moves. A flat is comprised of three moves. An ending diagonal looks like a rising wedge or a falling wedge. So what pattern is this? Yes, 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 exactly. And I actually went further and identified the counter trend moves within the slide. Okay, what do we have here? Ah, I thought I was going to go easy on you, huh? Awesome. Okay, you guys are getting it. Yes, it's a zigzag. And the intervening wave here is a flat. That's what, and now you can kind of understand what I was talking about earlier about with the line diagrams. If you have these little line diagrams, they're kind of easy. It's like a crossword puzzle. It's like, okay, this is where the A and the E go. Okay, here's an example of an ending diagonal in Netflix. Okay, why is this significant? Well, number one, it's significant because it's a good example of an ending diagonal. But what's important, and here's kind of a, one of the many takeaways I hope to offer today, is what happens following these patterns. For example, when a five-wave move is complete, it's retraced. A portion of it is retraced. And that's according to the guideline of depth of corrective waves. Whenever you have a five wave move, a retracement occurs that pushes prices back into the span of travel of the prior fourth wave, most often ending near its terminus. Okay, what happens after an ending diagonal finishes? Well, uh, resolution, meaning we, we fall, uh, if it's a, such as this, we would go back to beyond the origin of the pattern typically do so in one half to one third the time it takes the pattern to form. So whenever you see an ending diagonal, it gives you an expectation. A zigzag as a counter trend move will be more than fully retraced. A flat as a counter trend move will then also too be more than fully retraced. Triangles are unique in that as a counter trend move, whenever I see a triangle, I know it's going to be more than fully retraced. It's going to have a pop or a thrust higher, which we call a triangle thrust. But a triangle also, too, has another secondary uh, importance or effect, and that is it lets you know that this is the final wave of a sequence. So a triangle is like the market telling you the party's almost over, okay? And that you've got one more move, one more pop, and then you're done. This being an ending diagonal, what can I expect? What would, what would be my minimum expectation? Following the culmination of an ending, ending diagonal, I would look for the pattern to be more than fully retraced. So I'm looking for a move to here. That's what the pattern means. That's what the pattern implies, argues for. 
And that's what happened. Okay? TV of pharmaceuticals. Okay? What pattern is this? Up, down, up. Well, it's obviously a correction because I'm using letters. It's a zigzag because that's a five-wave move, that's a three-wave move, that's a five-wave move. So as a zigzag, as a counter-trend move, we know that it's going to ultimately be more than fully retraced. That's the expectation. So when I see a zigzag, when I see a price move such as this, I know it's going to be more than fully retraced. This is how that three-wave move, this little structure right here, fits into the larger wave count. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, three, four. So this wave count, this larger pattern, I'm confident the market's headed down already because that's a three-wave move. My confidence is increased even more so because I can now put this structure into a larger context which is in agreement. Everybody follow? So what should happen to Tevia? Sir? Exactly. And it did. From 26 to 6. Again, it's not like I'm an insider into the pharmaceutical business. You know, I buy aspirin, that's it. Um, but the chart, again, this goes back to my whole premise. Technical analysis is a language. And the better you understand the language of technical analysis, you'll be able to better understand the language of the market. And the better you understand that language, it's going to be as easy as reading a newspaper and knowing exactly what's going on. In fact, you'll be, the questions you have about, should I trade this market? Well, if you understand the language of the market, if you understand the language of technical analysis, you'll be able to know whether you should trade XYZ market or not. You should know where the market, how high is it going to go? That question, the chart will answer. Where am I wrong? Where's my protective stop should be? That question will be, you can ask that question. The chart will give you the answer. More pop questions. Sir? Uh, do you uh, do a game player? Yes. You do? Yes. Okay. And, uh, that would be in our catalog? Yes. My, my contact information. Okay, now here, do you see a pattern you recognize? And I'll, I'll help you out. I'll just give you a starting point. Start over here. Okay. Or, or rather than saying, do you see a pattern you recognize, let's, let's ask the real question. Who knows what the real question is? The more important question. Bingo. I got an A student here. Should you trade it? Are you long? Are you short? Who's long? Raise your hands. Who's short? Okay. Well, then that means a lot of us are not taking a trade. And for that, I applaud you. Okay? Too often, as traders, we feel like we have to be in the market. We have to be long. We have to be short. Remember, there's three positions you can take as a trader. Long, short, or flat. And sometimes being flat, sometimes being out of the market, is the most profitable thing you can do, especially if you don't know what's going on. There have been plenty of times I wish I had been flat the market rather than try and push it. Okay, the clue here is that. See the double top, top formation here? Uh, a key characteristic of a flat correction is that wave B ends at or near the origin point of wave A. That's how you can distinguish a flat correction from a zigzag. Also, too, the wave A portion of a flat will subdivide into three waves where the wave A portion of a zigzag will break down into five waves. So, this, since this is a flat correction, a, B, C, because it's a counter trend price move, I know the market's headed up. Does everybody see how I arrived at that conclusion? You don't see it? 
Okay. Down in A, up in B, wave B ends at or near the origin point of wave A, then you're followed by a five wave decline in wave C. Yeah, that would be like, a, say, a little bit of a one, two, three, four, five, done. And this is just, uh, <clears throat> again, what pattern incorporates the test of the high. And it's a flat. And that's what happened afterwards. We went up. And this is how um, I took advantage of that. Like I was talking to some of the earlier attendees. Uh, I like to trade options on stocks. Okay, now here is something very important that kind of leads into what I spoke about when I was doing the thing for the CME, but also I want everybody to understand because I still have I, I, the conversations, you know, is the top end, is the bottom end, have we topped here, have we bottomed here? Uh, there, there's this incessant need to bottom tick the market, top tick the market. I don't know. It, it's an ego game. Okay? If you're doing that, if that kind of fits you as a trader, stop it. Okay? It doesn't work. Have you top ticked the market before? I'm sure you have. Have I done it? Yes, I have. Um, but remember, we're in this, we're, we have the long game. Okay? We're not playing the short game here. We want to be doing this in five or 10 years. Preferably, when we want to be doing this so well that we can quit our day jobs, okay? Well, the way you do that is you always make it sure you have a seat at the table. And the way you do that is to not blow up your account. The way you do that is you keep it simple. You trade with the trend. You buy pullbacks and uptrends and sell bounces and downtrends. You manage your risk. More importantly, you manage your emotions because your emotions will, what, is what will get you into trouble more than anything else. The stupidest things I've ever done in my life, I've done when I've been in love. My emotions. My emotions. They got the better of me. Okay? Same thing happens when, when you trade. Because, I mean, you can sit at a chart and look at it and go, logically, it's like, yes, well, Mr. Kennedy, I do understand exactly what you're saying. As soon as you put that one dollar down, you buy that one share of stock, guess what? Money's involved. And whenever money's involved, you got skin in the game. It's different. Those are real bullets. Okay? The reason I like this example so much is because notice I did not buy the bottom tick. Notice after I got out, the market continued to go higher. My goal as a trader is to be a consistently successful trader. My goal as a trader is to make money. My goal as a trader is not to buy the bottom tick and sell the top tick. To me, a trade is like a party. I want to arrive fashionably late, and I want to leave before 5-0 shows up, before the cops come. Okay? It, really, think about it. Okay? Here, here. What are the odds of picking the bottom and pick it and buying the bottom and selling the top? What are the odds of that? Okay, let's say you do it once. What are the odds of doing it again and again and again and again? You can't do it. Okay, so hey, let's give up a little bit on the front end and a little bit on the back end. So maybe I'm 10% late getting into a trade, and I get out 10% early. I still make money. What if I get in 20% late? Because really, the more I let the market commit to me, the more I'm willing to commit to the market. I don't mind being late. Again, that's not the point. The point's to make money. And by letting the market give me that confirming price action, that's what I call it, confirming price action. OK, I live in Florida. I don't know how driving is here in Vegas, but I live in Florida. And the one thing you do not do in Florida, see you asleep. Okay, I thought I heard somebody asleep snoring. I'm going like, what's going on? Okay, um, the one thing you do not do in Florida if you're driving is you're trying to, you're pulling out and cars are coming 
and you want to take a left-hand turn. Okay, you see a car coming your way, and it has its turn signal on. Okay, if you see that, you do, you do not just pull out in front of the car, and you especially don't do it out in Florida, because we have a lot of old people in Florida, and they drive for 20 or 30 miles with their turn signal on. So you can't just simply trust the turn signal. Okay, you need that confirming price action. You need the car to slow down. Or, in the terms of a technician, you need to see a decrease in momentum. Then you need to see the car commit. You want to see the wheels of the car begin to really turn. Then you feel more confident. That's the way you drive, right? Then why isn't that the way you trade? Something to think about. Take it home with you. Another pop quiz. This is an impulse wave. Waves one, two, three, four, and five. Is this correct? Is this incorrect? If it's incorrect, why? If it's correct, why? Exactly. Exactly. I know this is kind of a silly slide, stupid slide, really. Uh, but no, it is incorrect because wave two does fall below the origin of wave one. Okay. I have this slide in here so I can get on my next soapbox. Okay, the wave principle is a tool. If you're going to use this tool, do it right. Or don't do it at all. Because if you do it and you don't follow the rules and follow the guidelines, you're not going to be happy with it. And then you're going to start bitching about it. And you're going to say the wave principle doesn't work and it's, not complica and it's complicated. Okay, that's not the case. The case is you don't know what you're doing because you're not following the rules and the guidelines. Moreover, because we're using, using a tool inappropriately, trading, remember, you can lose a lot of money really quick. Who has seen $20,000 go up in smoke like a day? That's the reality of the market. <laughs> hey, been there. I know what it's like. Okay, hey, <clears throat> the reason the financial markets are so attractive is because there's no other place you can go and make twenty, thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars in a day or more. I've seen people do it. But also they don't tell you the other side of the story. You can lose that in a day and more if you don't know what you're doing. The wave principle, as is all forms of technical analysis, are tools. There's nothing magic behind them. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's, uh, it's, they're simply tools. I like to say this, and I said this earlier. A knife, for example, is a tool. But a knife in the hands of a skilled surgeon can save lives. A knife in the hands of a lunatic can take them. If you use the tool wrong, don't be surprised if you lose money with it. That's like... That's like Bill buying a poorly built house and being angry at the hammer. Okay? These tools work if used properly and used well. And that requires practice. Practice, practice, practice. What's wrong with this? Well, simply put, it's not a flat. Three waves in wave A denotes a flat. But the B wave does not retrace at least 80% of the wave A decline. So it does not adhere and meet the definitions and the requirements of a flat. So it's not a flat. Don't call it a flat. But it looks like a flat. I don't care if it looks like a flat. It's not a flat. It doesn't meet the parameters. OK, more fun. Let's keep this simple. I love, I love simple. This might be worth writing down as well. OK. Impulsive price action, price action where the market is trending, is very decisive, very clear, very clean, just pew, up. Price action which is not impulsive, price action which is counter trend, has a distinct personality. It's choppy and sloppy, and tend more often than not is contained within parallel lines. Okay, so is this price action? Impulsive or corrective? Does this look like a trending price move? 
Does this look like a market you want to be a participant in? Okay, now because the angle of ascent on this move is up, and this fits the definition of a counter trend price move, what do you want to do as a trader? Are you buying or selling? Neither? You don't like it at all? Okay, fine. That's okay. Flat's okay. So are we long or short? Okay, that's a question we're asking the chart. The chart, if you understand the language of technical analysis, is telling you this is choppy, sloppy price action. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay, and also, too, just imagine a little line here over here and then a parallel of that line off the top. Counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. This is really important, by the way. Counter trend price action tends to be contained by parallel lines. So in other words, this is a counter trend move. It's a counter trend move up, which means I need to be selling the market. Here's how I would label it from an Elliott Wave perspective. And here's the trade that I took based off that analysis. Okay, I do not have a degree in economics. Uh, it's uh, math just doesn't do it for me. Um, I don't have, you know, uh, 10, 20, $50,000 proprietary software. Uh, I'm not looking at, uh, 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 this isn't secret stuff, okay? I'm doing what I teach you to do and what I teach my subscribers to do. That's a counter trend move. As, it, as a counter trend move, I want to sell the market. Okay. Same question, are you long or short? Because really at the end of the day, that's, that's ultimately where the uh, rubber meets the road. I've always said that I like to be a, an end user of technical analysis. Because I do the analysis ideally to identify a high confident trade setup that I can exploit or take advantage of that puts money in my pocket. It's kind of simple. And if, if the analysis warrants a trade, great. If the analysis doesn't warrant a trade, Again, is this something that looks impulsive? Okay, good, good. One thing that may help with that, if you, um, if you have pen and paper, and this is a trick, this will go in my next book. Uh, draw the face of a clock on your piece of paper. Like that, big circle, you're drawing the face of a clock. Okay, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Okay, if you're looking at your chart and the advance on the chart is between, say, 12 o'clock and 1.30, that's an impulsive advance. If you're looking at a decline and it's between 4.30 and 6, that's an impulsive decline. If you're looking at something and the advance is shallow between 1.30 and 4.30, that's going to be a counter trend move more often than not. So you can actually look at your clock watch face to aid you in identifying the slope because slope is very important. Okay, but you might say, well, Jeff, hold on a minute. If I compress the price bars and expand the price bars on my chart, I can make the slope do anything I want. You're exactly right. So don't be silly. What I like to look for as far as spacing is pretty much what you see here. I like to see, say, the pixels, the width of the price bar, equal the width of the space between the price bars. That's what I would call a properly scaled chart. And if you do that, then the little clock trick will work. Okay, so giving you cheat sheets, crypt notes. Okay, this move up, where is the slope of this advance? Is it between 12 and 130? What? Say no. Say no. No. Okay. Here's 12 o'clock. There's probably 130. 
Uh, that's probably about a two, well, three o'clocks over here. That's about a two o'clock slope. No. Can the move be contained within parallel lines? Okay, start a line here, go to here, take a parallel off the high. Yes, it can. So, we have two clues, two things on the chart. The chart's yelling at you. And of course, the wave principle, believe it or not, works very, very well with other forms of technical analysis. Don't be afraid to mix and match. I mean, I, I talk about you know my dog and pony show, but trust me, I'm not a one-trick pony. I know Elliot, I know candlesticks, I know momentum. I used to teach, again, at the college level for five years. I know this stuff, and it works really well. That's one thing I love about technicians is if you ever go to, like, here's Steve Neeson, he's like, candlesticks are the only way to go. Candlesticks, nothing else. If you go to an Elliott Wave seminar, not one of mine, but somebody else's, they might say, Elliot, that's all you need to know. Everything else doesn't matter. If you go to, say, anything like Gerald Appel does or uh, uh, Larry Williams, who's quite the character, he says, like, these momentum indicators, specifically my momentum indicators, that's all you need. You need nothing else. Okay, um, I'm here to tell you that, hey, it all works. It's all good. They enhance one another. Okay, and I use multiple different techniques and tools together, and I think all it does is it makes for a better case or a better argument. It gives me more confidence in actually taking a trade setup. And again, nice trade right there. Uh, I've only got like a few minutes left. Let me uh, just run to the uh, just final takeaway, because I get this question. There was another, another nice trade. I just want to share with you my favorite trade setup, okay? Within an Elliott, okay, this is what we call a, a classic eight-wave Elliott cycle. Five waves up, three waves down. Okay, you know, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, six, seven, eight. Okay, of these, and I talk about this in my book, of these patterns, of, of this sequence of events, this and this and this and this are your trading opportunities, Okay? Again, buying the pullback in an uptrend, buying the pullback in an uptrend. Okay, here we go picking the top, but then we sell the, sell the advance here for another move. My favorite Elliott Wave based trade setup is this sucker right there, four. The reason why is because a truncation, whenever a fifth wave move fails to make a new extreme beyond the peak of wave three, very rare event, very, very rare. So in other words, I may not be looking at the wave that will give me the biggest price gain, but I am looking at the wave that has the highest probability of success. Case in point, can everybody understand and see this count here? Waves one, two, three, and four. It's my favorite trade setup. And then what happened, and this is the breakdown of the internal substructure of this decline. I talk about this and we actually, uh, we did this for my trader's classroom. And then boom, nice move up from 25 almost all the way to 50. Simple pattern, very clear. All I had to do was understand the language. Uh, I'm done, I guess. You know, he's, he's, he's not going to kick me out, but I got to stop talking. Two more minutes. I got two minutes worth of questions. Sir. Okay. Do you believe that there is a super cycle? And where are we on the super cycle? What does that have to do with anything I just discussed today? Sir? What does that have anything to do with what I just discussed? Well, I just like to know where humanity is. Uh, Okay, as far as where humanity is, I am shocked that we're even here. Have you tried to get five people in a room and have a discussion about anything? Have you gone to Walmart and stood in line? How people are rude? And then I fly over a city, I'm in a plane, and it's like, I can't get five people, you know, My heating and air guy, I can't get him to come out at 2 o'clock when he says he's going to be 2 o'clock. 
how in the world did we even survive as a race? How did things even get built? So, as far as human, I mean, it depends how you look at things. On one hand, I'm surprised we're even here, even having this discussion. On the other hand, for those of us who have loved ones, we love our families. We want to take care of them. We have best friends. We have drinking buddies. We have good days and we have bad days. People, we have a lot more in common than what we have that separates us. It depends on how you want to look at the world. I've been hearing that the world's going to be coming to an end my whole life. You can go back and find books written in the 60s and 70s that were talking about major economic collapses. You can go back farther in time. Pretty much throughout the history of mankind, there was somebody out there, whether it was a religious group or an individual or a sect or whatever, that was preaching the world was going to come to an end and the devil was going to take us all. Hey, we're still here swinging. There are softwares out there that do automated wave counting. Okay? Uh, I prefer to do my own counting, such as I prefer to drive my own car. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to learn to do this yourself. I have not seen a software, an automated software out there uh, that can count better than me. And because it's my money, I trust me. I don't like trusting other people with my money. That's, if, if you don't know, the only person who knows what's best for you and your money is you. And if you don't know what to do with your money, it's your responsibility to learn. Uh, I saw this too frequently throughout my life. Uh, you know, hey, I had this money, I gave it to this guy, he invested it and it's gone. Uh, what was the guy? Uh, Oh, the big time swindler from a few years ago. Madoff. Yeah, bingo. There's my, you just, thank you for proving my point. Madoff. People saw something easy. Easy money. That's a good lure. That's a good hook. That's almost better than fear. You want somebody to react? Easy money. Or scare the hell out of them. One of the two. Hey, man, the world's going to hell tomorrow. But if you buy my book or follow me or do what I say, I can save you. Or, hey, easy money, get rich quick. Dude, you'll be looking at seven figures in nine months. Marketing. Yes. Yes. Great question. Excellent, excellent question. Do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. When you're doing Elliot, there's almost like a subconscious predisposition to rush the wave count. Okay? I got to wrap it up? Okay, I'll answer this one question. Um, we've all done this. And what I mean by that is, okay, you don't have to be right to make money in the markets. Okay? Uh, I've been right and I've, been and I've lost money, I've been wrong, and I've made money. And you all have as well. Case in point, how many of you have gotten into a position, see, and you're like, hey, I love this, I, you know, crude, euro, whatever, down, whatever. Okay, you, 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 you take the position, and then it starts to go against you, just a little bit at first. Then it just gets hotter and deeper. Then finally you're like, man, I guess can't take it. I can't take this $5,000 hit or whatever. So you cut it loose. And as soon as you do, what happens? You were right. You just were early. So if you get stopped out, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just take your time. Shake it off. What's important to remember, and then i got to run, is when you have a losing trade, Take a break, take a breather. The reason why is because you're suffering from a very mild form or minor form of post-traumatic stress syndrome. If you have a winning trade where you just knock it out of the park, 10 times your money, 
take a break, take a breather. Because you're so excited, those endorphins are popping off in your brain, man, nothing can touch you. You're, it's like, why isn't you know, the Wall Street Journal calling me for interviews right now? I just, 10 times my money. Okay, you're high, you're trading high. You gotta, you gotta calm down. Okay, so if you're wrong on a trade, don't just step back from it, give it a couple of days, go back, see what you missed, and more, it, in the military, they do something that I highly recommend everybody do. It's called an after action review, an AAR. Uh, when you do something, take a trade, right or wrong, after you've exited the position, go back and take a look. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? Do more of what you did right, do less of what you did wrong. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>